we have a lot of huge problems. We have the nuclear problem in Korea, we have the nuclear problem in Iran, in, uh, uh, we, we have, of course, the whole, whole array of problems, each of which, Afghanistan, uh, and, and so forth, but then we have the uh, financial issues. But they really are issues of the construction of a new world order. That's what this is about. What is our common bond truly? Freedom! Seeds of world government were sown in the Congress of Vienna, fortified with the attempt at the League of Nations in 1919, which failed. But the efforts for world government continued, and even outwardly, in newsprint, in the media, in magazines, talking about a one world government. But the nation was too distracted to pay much attention. Why, why would Babe Ruth and then the Depression coming, they had other thoughts than worrying about world government. But it's ironic how the writings in that period, especially the period prior to World War II, were so moving our nation with uh, propaganda towards that. And I'll illustrate that in this presentation. In fact, um, David Ben-Gurion, the Prime Minister, former Prime Minister of Israel, made the most startling prediction of all, if you can call it that, <laughs> in 1962 in Look Magazine, and I quote, The image of the world in 1987, now remember, this was from January 16th, 1962, ladies and gentlemen, incredibly perceptive, if not for an actual plan. The image of the world in 1987, as traced in my imagination, the Cold War will be a thing of the past. Internal pressure, the constant growing intelligentsia in Russia for more freedoms, and the pressure of the masses for raising their living standards may lead to gradual democratization of the Soviet Union. But on the other hand, the increasing influence of the workers and farmers and their rising political importance of men and science of science may transform the United States into a welfare state with a planned economy. And isn't that exactly what's happened to us, ladies and gentlemen? Back to the quote. Western and Eastern Europe will become a federation of autonomous states having a socialist and democratic regime. That's the EU. With the exception of the USSR as a federal federated Eurasian state, all other continents will become unified in a world alliance at whose disposal will be an international police force. All armies will be abolished and there will be no more wars. In Jerusalem, the United Nations, a truly United Nations, will build a shrine of the prophets to serve the federated union of all continents. This will be the seat of the Supreme Court of Mankind to settle all controversies among the federated continents, as prophesied by Isaiah. Higher education will be the right of every person in the world. A pill to prevent pregnancy will slow down the explosive natural increase in China and India. And by 1987, the average lifespan of man will reach 100 years. Well, as you know, several of those... Uh, predictions came true already. And several more have yet to come. Here's the late William Cooper with more evidence. You're listening to the worldwide broadcast of the Hour of the Time. I'm your host, William Cooper. Tonight, for those of you who have written and called telling me that there has never been any plans for a one-world government I'm going to shake your tree tonight. You are absolutely wrong. You are living in fantasy land, and tonight you are going to hear the proof, proof that you can look up and dig out for yourself, and you're only going to get a very tiny, small minority portion 
of the truth that exists in the world to prove that not only are there plans for one world government, but these plans began before the United Nations was ever even created. Don't go away, folks. You're going to be blown right out of your mind by tonight's broadcast. The Philadelphia Bulletin, October the 22nd, 1942. Headline, Aim for Allies, Smash Axis and Establish World Government. The article, An All-Out Allied Offensive Against the Axis Unity in Post-War Aims Should Be Followed by International Cooperation and a World Government. These are the essential findings in the 11th Roundtable on Prospects for 1943 in the October Free World magazine. Participating in the discussion were Ernest Minock Patterson of Philadelphia, President of the American Academy of Social and Political Science and author of The Economic Basis of Peace and America, World Leader or World Led. Sir Norman Angell, winner of the Nobel Peace Prize. General Julius Deutsch, former Australian Minister of War and prominent international labor leader. Max Lerner, professor of political science at Williams College and contributing editor of The New Republic, whose most recent books are The New Federalist and Ideas for the Ice Age. Eugene Lyons, editor of the American Mercury and author of Assignment in Utopia. Max Werner, military analyst and author of The Great Offensive, The Strategy of Coalition Warfare. And William Ziff, author of The Coming Battle of Germany, which was published in the Bulletin in Serial Form. The discussion over which Louis Dolovit presided came to these conclusions. Number one, the United Nations must launch an all-out offensive against the Axis. In this total war, a division of functions among the different nations is imperative. Equally important is the emphasis on the use of air power, including the bombing of German industrial centers, railway communications, and supply bases. Two, the total war imposes in the political field the need for greater unity in the planning and expression of post-war aims. Three, although some progress has been made in enlightening public opinion in the democracies concerning present issues and the problems of a future world order, a concerted effort to educate the masses regarding the interdependence of nations and the need for international cooperation is indispensable to the winning of the war and to the establishment of permanent peace for the creation of the machinery of a world government in which the present United Nations will serve as a nucleus is a necessary task of the present in order to prepare in time the foundations for a future world order. Ladies and gentlemen, that article, as I stated at the beginning, appeared in the Philadelphia Bulletin, October the 22nd, 1942, before the United Nations was ever formed in the public eye, it had been formed in secret. This is an admission of that fact and of a plan for a new world order. Ladies and gentlemen, they talked about the interdependence of nations, something that was just not too long ago put forth in this country. And there's much, much more. Now, for you bigots and you skeptics and you stupid people out there and the sheeple who have a chance, and the sheeple are the only ones who do have a chance, besides the ones who have already awakened and understand what's happening, you'd better pay close attention to me and you had better stop being stupid. Wake up. Wake up, ladies and gentlemen. Mr. Rhodes' agents. Cecil Rhodes was a great Englishman, and like all great Englishmen, completely devoted to his own nation. He made the extension of the British dominion in South Africa his life work. He believed without reservation in the British Empire as a power for good in the world, and in his remarkable will made provision for the use of his fortune to extend that influence. The Rhodes scholarships have been a tremendous asset to the British Empire. Their value to the nations on whose people they have been bestowed has been dubious, a result with which Mr. Rhodes was naturally unconcerned. Representative J.W. Fulbright of Arkansas is the author of the slick-termed resolution seeking to pledge Congress in advance to a world super-government. 
He is a Rhodes Scholar. Representative Robert Hale of Maine is touring the country making speeches on behalf of the similar ball bearing hatch resolution pending in the Senate. He is another Rhodes Scholar. The scholarships were created to corrupt Americans, and it is obvious that they have been successful in part. To what extent, we do not know. All of the Rhodes Scholars in this country should declare themselves, if they still possess loyalty to the American Union, they should state the fact and make it apparent by their public acts. If their allegiance has been subverted, they should have the public decency to admit it and present themselves honestly as British agents and not as American citizens. Great Britain is now drowning in Marxism and Socialism. William Clinton and his wife Hillary are Marxists and Socialists. If you don't believe that statement, you just keep an eye on the future, the future course of this nation. We are five Wake up, days people. away from Wake fundamentally up. transforming the United States of America. You, get a two by four and hit them upside the head. Wake them up also. When the American Rhodes Scholars educated in England with the money of an Englishman who intended that they should help to bring the United States back into the British Empire, were shown in the Tribune to be occupying high positions in our federal government, the Tribune offered them space in its columns to absolve themselves of the suspicion of seditious activity. The Tribune named 49 Rhodes Scholars and 14 other Oxonians in the federal payroll and identified their jobs, most of them policy-making positions. It told how Cecil John Rhodes, the great diamond and gold mine proprietor and British imperialist, conspired to launch a political revolution. His Oxford scholarships were intended to establish a secret society aimed at extending British rule throughout the world and particularly over the United States. Not one of these imperialist trained Americans who invited suspicion by accepting the Rhodes gratuity has offered to affirm his loyalty to the United States or to deny devotion to Rhodes. Rhodes imperialism.